Biogeography is the study of the distribution of species and ecosystems through geologic time and geologic space. Biogeography is a very important field of study for evolutionary biology because it helps explain the distribution of species over time and it helps to explain how geologic changes influence how species evolve. One of the very interesting parts about biogeography is how an understanding of how life evolved can also help us understand and follow how geological changes occurred over time. In this episode, we'll talk about some types of evidence that we have from biogeography and how we study biogeography. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. In my previous video, we talked about the, the, the formation and then the breakup of Pangaea as sort of an introduction to what bio, biogeography is all about. One of the things that we talked about is that evolutionary theory helps you corroborate evidence we have from plate tectonic theory, um, and, as well as other geologic forces acting on the planet over time. Some of the things that help us understand how species change over time, as well as how the planet has changed over time, is by looking at things like the distribution, fo the distribution of fossil species. So for example, when geology, uh, or when the geologic record tells us that two, two landmasses were united as a single landmass, it's very common to find the species fossils distributed over both landmasses. However, after a certain point in time in which the geologic record tells us that those continents were no longer uh, together that they were separated uh, through some type of geologic event, we no longer find species, we need, no longer find fossils of both species, uh, of a species, a single species across both land masses. We tend to find it on one or the other. So again, you have the fossil evidence sort of agreeing with what the geological evidence tells us. One of the other things that biogeography teaches us is why there is a north-south distribution of speciation events. By studying the geologic record, we know that when Pangaea began to break up during the mid-Jurassic, that it split along a north-south axis into two continents, Laurasia and Gondwana, which would themselves begin to break up into disparate continents as well, giving us the Earth that we know today. Without the geologic understanding, it would be difficult to explain why when we look at the fossil record, we see this north-south distribution of fossils. On the other hand, without that north-south distribution of fossils, it might also be a little bit challenging to understand why or how Pangaea broke up the way it did. Again, we see the fossil evidence correlating with the geologic evidence. But are there modern day examples that can also help us understand how biogeography works? Here's a great example. Let's look at the North American elk and the European red deer. Now, when you look at these two species side by side, it's very difficult to tell which one's actually which. Unfortunately, I've labeled them for you. What's interesting is that these two are absolutely, as you would expect, each other's closest relative. In fact, they're so close that North American elk can actually interbreed with European red deer and produce perfectly viable offspring, which seems to indicate that uh, these two species diverged from each other very, very recently. In fact, the molecular evidence backs that up. But when you think about it, and if you remember my previous talk about Pangaea, you'll know that North America and Europe really haven't been in contact with each other, at least they separated when Pangaea broke apart, uh, tens of millions of years ago, long before either of these species actually existed. So we have to think to ourselves, how in the world then did a single species get spread apart two continents, which is the most logical reason for these two species to be so closely related. And then we have to remember something else. Until about 20,000 years ago, there was actually a land bridge that connected Eastern Asia with, the, with Western North America. This was known as Beringia. It sat in the site of the modern day Bering Sea off the coast of Russia and the coast of Alaska. But 20,000 years ago, during the last ice age, ocean levels were actually low enough that the bottom of Bering Sea was actually land, which would have allowed the free movement of what are now modern day uh, European red deer and North American elk, which was at that time a single United Species, to roam freely across the top of all three of these continents. However, after about 20,000 years ago, ocean levels rose, cutting off that land bridge. And as a direct result, 
it became impossible and those two, two, those two populations became isolated. And over time, the North American elk have diverged slightly. They've taken on their own, uh, edu- they've taken on their own evolutionary path and become slightly different to become a distinct species from the uh, European red deer that have been on isolated on their own, um, their own evolutionary path as well. Although we can go back to the biological species concept and argue, well, if they can interbreed to produce viable offspring, are they really two separate species? And then we're right back into our conversation about polar bears and grizzly bears, and now we recognize just how confusing evolution can actually be. Let's look at another example, magnolias. Magnolias are these beautiful flowering trees uh, that uh, bloom uh, very rapidly in the spring uh, where they grow and produce these beautiful blooms and they drop their leaves and uh, then they're just another normal deciduous tree. What's very interesting about magnolias is they are some of the earliest, they're some of the oldest and earliest evolving flowering plants on the planet. In fact, as far as we can tell in the fossil record, magnolias may actually predate bees. That's how old they are. Magnolias are found in a very unique distribution pattern. We find them largely across uh, southwestern Asia. And then we also find them sort of along the eastern, southern United States and into Central America. Now, when you look at that species distribution pattern, that's pretty crazy. Uh, Because both, I mean, to get both of those together, I mean, really, you're either separated by the Pacific Ocean on one end or the Atlantic Ocean on the other. So how is it possible that these species made it into this unique distribution pattern? Well, there's lots of ways this could have happened. First and foremost, magnolias are really old, like over 100 million years old as a species. And fossil evidence suggests that at one time, magnolias actually stretched across the, bar- the broader part of Asia all the way through Europe and existed in a broad band across all of North America. So it's quite possible that magnolias actually evolved and were able to spread before North America and Greenland broke away from the, for the rest of, from, from Europe and Asia during the breakup of Pangaea. But the other option is we can go right back to the fact that that, that land bridge of Beringia existed until about 20,000 years ago. So it's quite possible that during that time period, magnolias were actually able to be dispersed across that. Although the fossil evidence is kind of hard to find because it's at the bottom of a really, really cold portion of the Northern Pacific Ocean. Let's talk about another really in-depth example that we have really good evidence of that answers a pretty interesting question about the world as we know it today that's really only answered by understanding how biogeography works. Marsupials. Modern-day marsupials are really only found on two continents. We find them uh, several spe- several hundred species in South America. But if you think about marsupials, the first thing you think about is the continent of Australia. Now, picture where South America and Australia actually exist and recognize that they are thousands of miles away from each other uh, across oceans. Okay. Now, how in the world did marsupials get into Australia? And I say get into Australia because the fossil evidence suggests that marsupials actually first evolved in the northern hemisphere, but apparently somehow they made it into the southern hemisphere, uh, into South America, and that's really where they took root. They were very unsuccessful when they first evolved hundreds of millions of years ago in the northern hemisphere, and uh, actually really took on and really took off and diversified quite heavily in the southern hemisphere, particularly in modern day South America. But the question then becomes, when marsupials really begin to be a dominant species, or really show up in the fossil record about 130 million years ago, how did marsupials make it from South America, where we know they really first populated the planet, into, into Australia? Now, if you think about the way, the, the way this could have happened, we have to remember that when Pangaea first broke up, it broke into two continents, Laurasia, which is modern-day North America, Europe, and Asia, and into Gondwana, which is modern-day Africa, South America, Antarctica, Australia, and India. Okay. But how did marsupials make it from South America into Australia? Well, there's two possible routes if you think about the way this is constructed. The first route is the African route, which would state that that marsupials made it from South America across Africa and then eventually made it into Australia before Australia broke away. Here's the problem with the African scenario. There are no fossils of marsupials in Africa at all. There's like one species. That's it. The bigger problem is that Africa and South America actually became isolated from each other like 184 million years ago, which predates the evolution of marsupials by about 50 million years, which means it probably didn't happen that way. Which leaves the only other possible route as the Antarctic route. 
but that kind of makes our brain feel weird, right? Because when we picture Antarctica, we picture like a few thousand emperor penguins with eggs on their feet, uh, some seals, and a lot of cold and not much. In other words, it's not a particular place where you would think you would find, I don't know, a koala or a wallaby or anything like that. And you're right. But biogeography, uh, how was the answer to that? Why would it be possible for, Al for Antarctica to be the route by which marsupials made it into Australia? Well, if we go back to what Antarctica used to look like, up until about 35 million years ago, Antarctica wasn't Antarctica as we know it. It was actually quite hospitable. In fact, evidence suggests that lots of different species lived in Antarctica and that it was probably much more similar to uh, like a boreal forest, like, you know, you know, coniferous forest type environment like we would find in Canada or northern Russia. In other words, it was hospitable to species that would be marsupial in nature. But how did species make it from South America into Australia via Antarctica? Well, if we look at what the continents were arranged like up until about 90 million years ago, South America was actually in contact with Antarctica which means it's very likely that marsupials could have made it into Antarctica. And Antarctica was in contact with Australia until about 35 million years ago, which at that point, Australia broke away, and that's when a, um, a circumpolar current began to form, and that's when Antarctica became the snowball that it is today, and nothing really lives there except for a few penguins and some seals and a couple research scientists uh, at the bottom of the globe. So if Africa is out, the only real way would be through the Antarctic route. But again, we go to Antarctica, right? Crazy. But if this scenario is true, shouldn't there be proof of it? Because remember, we can actually, I mean, now we're in the world of evolutionary theory, right? We're saying that species can't just pop into existence on a continent. They must have gotten there from somewhere else. And we know where point A is in South America. We know where point C is, which is Australia, so there should be fossil evidence of the species existing at some point at point B, which is Antarctica. And it seems like a long shot, until some researchers actually went to Antarctica and found fossil remains of da -da -da -da, marsupials. Um, so when you look at it this way, it's actually a pretty crazy story. Yes, up until about 35 million years ago, marsupials probably did exist in Antarctica, living there quite happily, until eventually it turned into this frozen tundra wasteland. They all died out, and the last remainder of those uh, remnants of those species are now in existence um, as ancestors of the modern-day marsupials that we find in, in Australia. Again, this particular example shows the predictive power of evolutionary theory. There's no reason for there to be fossils of marsupials in Antarctica. Unless, of course, marsupials at one point lived in Antarctica, which would mean that Antarctica wasn't always a frozen tundra wasteland, which is exactly what the geologic record tells us, that at one point it was actually part of a pretty lush forest environment when it was connected to other continents before they abandoned it at the bottom of the globe. So again, we have geologic evidence agreeing with fossil evidence telling us that, you know, evolutionary theory tells us exactly what we'd expect uh, out of the way life changed over time. Another interesting feature that we encounter in the world of biogeography are things known as clines. Uh, so clines are interesting. If you take a species that's distributed over a very wide area, um, and there are lots of species that exist this way, um, or multiple species in some cases, uh, groups of species, we can actually see that there is a distinct phenotypic change that occurs on a gradient as the environment changes. So um, a lot of clines that we actually study are what we call linear clines. So a great example of this comes from studying warm-blooded animals. It turns out that if you're a warm-blooded animal, um, the farther north you go towards the North Pole, um, the heavier you're going to be. So, for example, if you look at grizzly bears that live farther north, they're actually going to be bigger and way more than grizzly bears that live in the southern portions. And kind of understandable why. Uh, that body weight that they hold on, the fat that they hold on actually provides them with insulation so that they can survive at colder temperatures. Um, uh, one study actually studied foxes and they actually showed the same thing, that the farther north you go, uh, the, the heavier the average weight of the fox, uh, again indicating that it was likely a, cha a phenotypic change. Now they're all the same species, it's just if you look at species, individuals of that species farther north, they tend to uh, weigh significantly more than members of the species that live further south in warmer climates. So 
there does and this seems to be a trend that holds whether you're at the north pole or the south pole that the colder you get uh, the colder environments you get the more like that the heavier a warm-blooded animal is going to be Another interesting study in clines came from uh, the world of ornithology, so the study of birds. Uh, one of the things that was noticed is that when we look at tropical environments, so warm humid environments, they actually tend to result in increased pigmentation uh, of birds and actually of other warm-blooded animals. Um, it seems to be some sort of trend. It could be a protective trend to sort of absorb more of the sun ray, sun's rays, but the warmer and the more humid an environment gets, the more colorful the species tend to be, and uh, the cooler, the more dry an environment gets, uh, the less colorful a species happens to be. These are examples of clients. They're simply phenotypic changes in a species that uh, are the result of changes in, in, in an environment that are related to the biogeography of that particular environment. But one particularly cool study in the world of clines are known as ring species. So ring species occur when a cline wraps around itself. Quite often it's wrapping around a geologic structure. A great example of this comes from the Laris gulls. So there are uh, several species of Laris gulls that wrap, that exist in a cline that sort of wraps itself uh, around the, the Arctic Circle. So these birds live, um, if you've seen seagulls, that's, you're looking at a Laris gull, okay? So uh, what's interesting is uh, there are seven species of or seven or eight species of Laris gulls that exist around the top of the globe. And if you look at these different species, um, they're sort of like a, a super cline, if you will, because they are truly distinct species. And if you look at any neighboring species, they are able to interbreed and produce viable offspring. So, for example, on this graph here, species one is able to interbreed with species two. Species two can interbreed with species three, species three can interbreed with species four, and so on and so forth. But when you get to the end of the climb, when the ring wraps it back around itself, so that the last species of Laris gull in order, the one from uh, the, the last species here, cannot actually interbreed with the first species. What this tells us is there's been a significant enough evolutionary change over sort of this continuum of a of a cline that these species are no longer to actually they're so different from each other that they're not able to interbreed yet if they can interbreed with the species directly next to it and work its way back which is really really interesting another great example of this is the instantina uh the instantina uh, salamander species that wrap exists in a cline that wrap themselves around the sierra nevada mountains again you can see that each neighboring salamander species is completely capable of interbreeding with the ones directly next to it but on the other hand, when you get to the end of the ring, the rings at the species at either end are so phenotypically different that they're actually not able to interbreed. This is really interesting um, because what it does appear when we look at ring species that each of these species existed in some way in some type of geographic isolation for a, for a brief time enough to form a speciation event. And then you get these subsequent speciation events as the species sort of works its way around the ring. And eventually these species at the ends are so different that by the time you get to the end, um, they're no longer uh, able to interbreed. It's almost like a genetic game of telephone where the information, the genetic information gets so mutated by the time you get to the end that when the last person in the telephone chain tells the first person what the message was supposed to be, it's so different that the first person's like, yeah, that's not what I said at all. And that's kind of what happens with ring species, which are just really a special version of a cline. Perhaps one of the most important things to talk about when it comes to evolution, though, is understanding the environments in which species live. So if you recall, evolutionary fitness is tied to two things. It's tied to the genetic makeup or what traits that particular individual possesses, but it's also influenced by the environment, right? That's how natural selection works. When we talk about, uh, when we talk about the environment, what we're largely talking about, particularly in terrestrial environments, are what we refer to as biomes. So biomes are large, uh, large habitats or large ecosystems of flora and fauna uh, that exist in a defined geographic area. Now, biomes are largely influenced by what are called abiotic factors. They're the amount of sunlight that a particular area of the world gets. They're tied to the amount of precipitation that exists on an annual basis. They're tied to the average temperature uh, of that particular environment. What I want to do uh, in the second half of this video is actually go through a number of the most common biomes that we're going to encounter and talk about how the environments actually force the convergent evolution of species that existed. Because for the most part, these biomes don't exist in one place on Earth. We'll see that these biomes exist on multiple continents and that all of the species, which are often separated by tens or hundreds of millions of years of evolutionary history from each other, 
can often look quite similar. And again, it helps us to understand in biogeographic contexts why species look the way they do, but also helps to support evolutionary theory because in all fairness, a tropical rainforest is a tropical rainforest. Anything that lives in one could certainly live in another tropical rainforest, but they don't. Why? Because evolution doesn't allow for that. Species have to evolve where they happen to be based on the environmental conditions. So let's start with tropical rainforests. Tropical rainforests are going to be found around the equator. In terms of daylight, daylight's not going to change. You're going to get 11 to 13 hours uh, or 11 to 12 hours of daylight pretty much all year round. There really are no seasons and they're going to get well over 600 centimeters of precipitation, almost always in the form of rain uh, throughout the year. It's probably going to rain at least once, maybe multiple times a day. In terms of terrestrial biomes, uh, tropical rainforests have the highest biodiversity on the planet, uh, perhaps second only to uh, coral reef systems in terms of the amount of bio biodiversity that we see there. They are going to have very little seasonal change with respect to precipitation or sunlight or temperature, and it's going to be consistently warm, usually somewhere between uh, 25 and 35 degrees Celsius. So let's look at a few examples of convergent evolution that we see in tropical rainforests. First off, first off, with all of that rain, you're commonly going to get some very large river systems. Look at the Amazon River, for example. Uh, both the Amazon River uh, in South America, as well as some of the major river, uh, river systems in Southeast Asia, both of which are tropical rainforest biomes, have their own species of riverine dolphin. So these river dolphins, whether it's the Amazonian River Dolphin or the Asian River Dolphin, uh, both have adapted to life in sort of the, uh, the rapid current freshwater systems of major rivers. However, they are not each other's nearest relative. They can both trace their most direct ancestor back to a marine dolphin that exists in that particular area of the world. They've just happened to adapt to that. They have very similar body plans. They have the ability to uh, be in freshwater as opposed to saltwater, which most dolphins can't. And they've developed very strong body plans in order to be able to navigate rivers that have a current as opposed to oceans that don't have strong currents and to be able to see in less clear water. We can also look at some of the apex predators. In a lot of places, whether it's in Asia or Africa, you're gonna, or even South America, you're gonna find a big cat. It's gonna be the jaguar in South America. It's gonna be a tiger in Asia. It could be a lion or a leopard in Africa. But when you go to the island of Madagascar, which also has a tropical rainforest biome, there are no big cats. In another video, we'll talk about why there aren't big cats. But suffice to say, there are no big cats in Madagascar. Do they have something that fills that ecological niche? Absolutely. It's actually a giant mongoose relative known as the fossa. Now, if you look at the body plans and look at its lifestyle, you would argue that this fossa looks and behaves almost exactly as a big cat would, filling that ecological niche. In fact, it even has retractable claws uh, like many of those cats do, uh, which is a unique adaptation that other mongooses don't have. Nevertheless, you can see the result, the effect of convergent evolution. It's simply similar selection pressures uh, forcing this animal to sort of evolve in this particular way. If you look at tropical rainforests, you can also see some type of poison amphibian. Uh, in, in South America, you would be looking at the poison dart frog. If you go to Madagascar, you would find the mantella. Both of these are brightly colored amphibians that are able to secrete an alkaloid toxin through their skin that it makes them poisonous to the touch. Both of them create those through the consumption of invertebrates, so they eat bugs or something else to build those toxins, and neither of them is particularly closely related with the exception of the fact that they are frogs. They've both evolved independent ways of harvesting those alkaloids from their food and turning them into a toxin. Plants are not exempt from this, of course. If you look at these tropical rainforests, one of the things they're most named for, known for are their canopies. So uh, canopies don't form all at once. They actually form quite slowly over time. Now, what you see is two different types of trees that exist. You have what are called pioneer trees, and then you have your climax trees. Pioneer trees have evolved to grow very, very rapidly to fill those spaces. They can grow to very great heights uh, very, very quickly. Now, if you look at these, and if you look at, for example, a Southeast Asian rainforest and compare it to a South American rainforest, you'll see that there are different trees with very similar adaptations. If you go to South America, one of the pioneer tree is going to be a is going to be balsa. If you go to Southeast Asia, it's going to be something called a macaranga. But what's interesting about both of these trees is that they both have developed this weird sort of body plan where they're hollow. Um, and essentially they build almost like this, they make this weird type of wood with a hollow trunk 
that's very, very strong. They're able to grow very, very rapidly since they don't grow solid. Now, they are kind of capped at their maximum height because of this hollowness, and they're also eventually outcompeted by a neighboring tree that's eventually known as the climax tree. And again, what we see when we look at these climax trees is they have the same overall body plan. They grow very, very slowly at first, but can reach several hundred feet in height. But again, if we look at and compare Southeast Asian rainforests to South American rainforests, we can see that there are significant differences in the species that make these up, even though they are phenotypically similar. If you look at the climax species in South America, they're going to be known as Kapox. If you look at the species in Southeast Asia, they will be the Tuolong trees. Now, again, that's not to say that, that for example, uh, that a, a balsa tree could not grow in, a, in the rainforest of Vietnam. It absolutely could. And a Macaranga could come over and grow in, in the Amazonian rainforest. It absolutely could. So why don't they? The answer is simple. They are separated by tens of millions of years of evolutionary divergence. I mean, the only thing they really have going for them is that they are technically deciduous trees. That's about it. Uh, that's their closest relationship. They've evolved similar body plans. They've evolved similar evolutionary paths simply because they evolved in very similar biomes, not because of any direct relation between each other. Again, this is convergent evolution leading to analogous body plans or analogous structures. Another common biome are savannas. So savannas are very dry grasslands. They are located in the same region of the world as tropical rainforests. So they're going to be tropically located. They're still going to get the 11 to 20 hours or 11 to 12 hours of sunlight year round. However, they have significantly less rain. Uh, they're going to have um, just a fraction of the rainfall, uh, 20 to 40 centimeters of rainfall uh, all year long. Uh, and it's actually, there's going to be large seasonal differences. So they're going to have uh, like a month or two of a wet season and then nothing for like 11 to 10 to 11 months after that. Um, so the plants and the animals, uh, obviously there's significantly less biodiversity there, but the plants and the animals will have to have that live in, in savannas are going to have to be adapted for this. And when it comes to plants, because it's so dry, um, this, these particular biomes are subject to frequent wildfires. So the plants there have actually evolved the ability to be fire resistant and to sprout fairly rapidly after being consumed by fire. On the other hand, the animals have had to evolve ways to sort of stay out of the very hot sun because the temperatures are still going to range from 20 to 30 degrees Celsius uh, year round. Uh, and also cope with the fact that they're not going to have a lot of water around. So if we look at savanna biomes, two great, two great places to compare are South Africa and uh, looking at Australia. In terms of the plant life in savannas, if we compare what we see in South Africa, we'll see things like camphors and aloes and uh, red alders uh, that typically exist, or, uh, uh, or those are also known as ruyels, uh, that also exist in South Africa. They've evolved a way of being very fire resistant. Um, so they don't burn very easily, so fire, wildfires can kind of pass over them and they still survive. We see very similar adaptations in Australian plants, uh, such as blue bushes and salt bushes. Um, we see them also in acacia trees, as well as with the eucalyptus trees that are favored by the koalas. Uh, these trees are very adapted to these environments. Uh, they are very flame resistant, and in the case of eucalyptus, actually um, sprout very rapidly after fires start, um, which allows them to survive. Animal species also have adapted. So if you look at what we see in Australia, you'll be looking at species such as kangaroos, koalas, bandicoots, sugar gliders that have all sort of adapted to sort of hide from the sun during the day. They live around what little plants are out there to get moisture from them. A lot of them even hide underground or undergo daily torpor, which is they just kind of hide out until it's night. They really only come out at night in many cases. Uh, in South Africa, similar adaptations, but instead you'll be looking at species like greasebok and springbok, uh, horseshoe bats, um, and, and species like that, which also have similarly adapted to sort of live underground or really only come out and come out at night uh, when they can uh, stay away from the very hot sun in the dry environment to conserve water and to prevent, protect themselves from the heat. Subtropical deserts, uh, this is when we get slightly farther away from the equator. So these are usually around uh, 10 to 30 degrees of latitude. They kind of hover right around the uh, tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. 
Subtropical deserts uh, can range from being very hot, 60 degrees Celsius, to very cold, 0 degrees Celsius, and often all in the span of a single day. Uh, the reason for that is they get almost no precipitation. Um, some of these literally get zero centimeters of precipitation annually, uh, and it may only rain there like once every other year or so. Uh, there is not surprisingly very little biodiversity here, and the uh, plants and animals that do exist in the environments, uh, these environments have, have to have some very extreme adaptations in order to survive. Um, one of the best examples of this is to look at what we see with plants, um, whether you're looking at an old world desert, things like uh, we find in Africa and Asia, or a new world desert like we find in uh, the United States, uh, the southwestern parts of the United States, um, you're going to see plants that are adapted in various ways. Typically, you're going to find things that have a very thick cuticle. Uh, they don't have leaves. They're going to have spines instead, wide, shallow root networks, and be prepared to go years without actually flowering. Um, and if you look at old world, world deserts, you'll be looking at things that look very similar to new world cactuses. They're called euphorbia or euphorbs um, that have adapted uh, this barrel shaped trunk to hold onto water, a thick cuticle to prevent water, uh, water loss. They've actually developed a, a different form of photosynthesis uh, to help retain water and actually do more of their photosynthesis at night uh, when the temperatures aren't so extreme and the evaporation will be less. But again, the thing to note is these forms of uh, these adaptations have largely come independent of each other. This is, these are examples of convergent evolution, uh, the, the advent of analogous structures uh, to do this because they're not particularly closely related. Animals, uh, if you're looking at animals, these are things that are going to find ways to deal with this extreme heat, the lack of water, and so on and so forth. In New World Deserts, uh, you're going to find uh, things like coyotes running around, wolves, um, you'll find, uh, you know, osprey, rattlesnakes, um, you know, uh, hares, species like that. If you go over to the old world, that's where you're going to find species like the dromedary camel. Uh, you'll start finding uh, species of, uh, you, you'll find um, uh, cobras and uh, you'll find old world eagles and hawks taking the place of the ospreys. You'll find uh, um Barbary sheep, and uh, you'll find um, other animals that we don't typically find in the New World. Again, all of these have very similar adaptations to deal with the vast, the vast changes in temperature and the high heat. Uh, they find ways to hide out underground, only come out at night, or stay in the shade where there's little shade possible. Moving slightly farther north uh, from the subtropical deserts, we encounter something called a temperate grassland. So temperate grasslands exist mainly in the central part of North America, where they're referred to as prairies, uh, or the central part of Eurasia, where they're referred to as steppes. Uh, when we go to the grasslands, uh, um, we're, what we're looking at is a place that has fairly low precipitation. They don't get enough precipitation where they're going to allow the growth of large trees. Uh, they're slightly more moist than, say, uh, a savanna would be. But again, like we see in the savanna, we're going to see uh, a, a plant environment that's largely dominated by grasses and shrubs. We're not going to see a ton of trees. As a result, these are going to be packed full of grazing animals. So examples of of, uh, of sort of analogous species that we find in North America, you're going to find grazing species uh, such as uh, such as buffalo, um, elk, white-tailed deer. If you go to your uh, Eurasia, what you're going to find actually are uh, Bactrian camels, uh, and, uh, ho wild horses, uh, for example, and and sheep actually uh, are are sort of the grazing animals that exist out there in Eurasia. Again. What you're looking at is very, very similar biomes that are affected by the temperature and the amount of sunlight. Uh, again, these species also have to deal with extreme uh, weather changes based on seasonal because based on seasonal changes. Um, in some parts of temperate glass, grasslands, the temperature can range from as high as 30 degrees Celsius in the summer to as low as minus 30 degrees Celsius during the winters. I mean, think about how cold winters can be. Uh, if you're in the United States, uh, think about how cold winters can be in places like Nebraska and Minnesota. Those are the temperate grasslands of the United States of America. Same thing in central Russia. I don't think it gets much colder than central Russia. I mean, Napoleon lost uh, because, of, uh, because of the Russian winter uh, because he got trapped in the steppes and had to retreat all the way back to France. That shows you how extreme the weather patterns can be. In roughly the same latitude, you'll also find temperate forests. Temperate forests that are, are slightly different with one exception. They don't get any more sunlight or, uh, during the year. They don't get uh, any warmer or any colder during the year, but they get more precipitation. And it's this precipitation that allows the growth of large trees. Rather than being a biome that's dominated by 
um, by shrubs and grasses, it's a biome that's dominated by trees and the animals and such that and the animals that live there have to actually adapt to these particular uh, environments. So for example, this is one of the places where we see a north-south split in terms of the species. In the northern, he northern hemisphere, these large deciduous trees are gonna be species of maple, elm, oak, beech. But if we go to the southern hemisphere and look at those temperate forests, they're largely going to be um, they're largely going to be species of southern beaches, uh, which are not closely related to those that we find in the northern hemisphere. Animal life in deciduous forests is quite abundant. Um, if, uh, you know, uh, where I'm from in New York, um, we are essentially a a, a, a a temperate forest biome, and this is where you're going to find things like squirrels and and, and possums and raccoons and species like that that have adapted to sort of life um, uh, on, on the forest floor as well as up in the trees. As we move farther north from there, we'll get to the boreal forests, or, or also known as the taiga. So these are going to be your coniferous forests. And these are going to exist in a ring around the northern part of the globe through Alaska, Canada, uh, the very northern parts of Europe, across Russia and northern Asia. They're going to sit between the temperate forests and temperate grasslands, but below, uh, but below the Arctic tundra that's within the Arctic Circle above them. These are going to be forest biomes dominated. They're the last bastion of the gymnosperms, which, as we'll learn in a subsequent video, uh, are actually the, were the dominant plant species on the planet for a very long time, a long time ago. This is the last bastion of where they hide out. Here, they're going to get a decent amount of precipitation, but it's mainly going to come in the form of snow for the most part. They might get some rain during the short growth season and during the summer, but a lot of it's going to be coming in the form of snow. Gymnosperms, species of pine and spruce um, that live in these environments, are, are actually able to survive in this cold weather. Uh, they are evergreen, so they don't drop their needles doing photosynthesis year round, despite the cold temperature and the very low levels of sunlight that they actually get during the winter months. And they actually can deal with the acidic soil that often exists here. Now, the one thing to note is there isn't a ton of divergence in species across the globe uh, when it comes to the species that exist in the taiga. And the main reason why is we have to remember that all of these parts that have boreal forests were all in contact via Beringia up until like the last 20,000 years or so. And as a result, there hasn't been a ton of speciation that's actually occurred. Nevertheless, there are distinct, distinct species of fir and pine and spruce that do exist in certain parts of Canada that don't exist in certain parts of Russia. All of them share the same adaptations, though, but this is the adaptations are likely the result of shared ancestry and not necessarily the result of convergent evolution in these cases. The last biome we'll talk about is the tundra. Tundra is interesting in that it really only is different than subtropical deserts in one aspect, the temperature. While subtropical deserts range from 0 degrees Celsius to 60 degrees Celsius, tundra biomes, arctic tundra biomes, could range in temperature from really, really cold to about 12 degrees Celsius maximum during the very, very brief summer they get that often lasts uh, no more than six to eight weeks. Now, these particular parts of the globe do not actually get very much precipitation. It's actually too cold in most cases for precipitation to occur. But what little they get sticks, and it's mainly in the form of snow. And the reason why is there's a thin layer of permafrost on the ground. This layer of permafrost is going to prevent uh, roots uh, from deep roots from forming, which means the overwhelming majority of plant life in the tundra is going to be very low to the ground. It's going to be things like lichens and mosses in the northern hemisphere. At this, uh, and, and in the northern hemisphere, there are upwards of 1,700 species of vascular flowering plants that actually do exist uh, up along the North Pole. In the South Pole, we see a, sh uh, a sharp difference. In the South Pole, we'll see uh, a few species of mosses, but mainly what we're going to find are lichens and terrestrial algae that exist, with only two known species of vascular flowering plants found in the South Pole. Animals, on the other hand, uh, we will we'll see a, a fair amount of convergent evolution there as well. Uh, when we look at them, we'll see in the North Pole, this is where we're going to find things like Arctic foxes, snowshoe hares, polar bears, uh, seals, and so on and so forth. At the Southern Pole in Antarctica, what we're going to see is almost none of that. We'll see penguins, 
uh, we'll see a different species of seals and we'll see albatrosses uh, down there. The one thing to note is that the species that exist here, if they are warm blooded and almost every one of them happens to be warm blooded because there's no other way to survive there if you're cold blooded, is they are going to have large body masses uh, as a form of, of, of convergent evolution. They're also typically going to have appropriate coloration. They're going to be uh, light or white in color to help them blend in with their environment. Another great example of convergent evolution. So in conclusion, biogeography really is sort of the study that links sort of how the earth exists ge uh, ge geologically uh, and geographically, as well as how life exists in response to that. Biogeography provides us with a wealth of very interesting information about how species adapt to their environments, about how species change over time, and how that relates to where they exist on the globe and abiotic factors, and how those abiotic factors shape them over time. The big thing to realize is this. When we look across the globe and we look at uh, the same biome in different locations, almost every time we see this, we see different species occupying the same ecological niches on different continents, even though they're in the same biome. They share similar adaptations, even though those adaptations are not the result of shared ancestry between the two species. They're the result of similar uh, evolutionary pressures acting on a single species over time, molding those species to best fit their environment. And unless the argument, uh, unless the argument is offered that there's some sort of special creation that's happening to create these species, we can put that argument to bed because that argument would center around the fact that these species are uniquely adapted for their own environment and that if that they would be able to outcompete then other species with similar adaptations. And we just know that that's not the case. We can point to the, the hundreds of invasive species that we have to be on the lookout for. So for example, Burmese pythons are from Southeast Asia, from a rainforest environment. But people have illegally brought Burmese pythons to the United States to keep them as pets. And now there's been a tremendous problem with the release of other tropical snakes, including Burmese pythons, boa constrictors that are from Asia in Florida. And the reason why is they are perfectly well adapted. And in fact, they thrive in the very similar environment in the Everglades of Florida. And they become quite the problem because these massive snakes are not indigenous to the area. They're an invasive species and they're going around destroying ecosystems because the species that live here have no defense for them. They're not used to dealing with those particular species and they're actually being greatly negatively impacted by these species. This is not, the, this is not what you would anticipate if, if these species were uniquely ad adapted for their own particular rainforest because they're not. They're just adapted very, via very similar selection pressures for any tropical rainforest. Invasive species we'll actually see in the next video are even more of a problem when we get to the most unique environments on the planet, which are islands. Thank you so much for tuning in today for our conversation about biogeography and biomes. I hope you learned a lot about how, uh, how the geography of a location, how the abiotic factors in a particular area uh, affect the evolution of species. In our next video, we'll talk about island biogeography and how life on islands shapes species. We'll even talk about the differences between the types of islands that we see. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope to see you next time. Bye.